today. If you could just post in the chat, take a minute, to tell us what it is that excites you about plants and One Health. Tell us who you are, where you're coming from. We'll be starting officially in about one minute's time. So this is just to get us warmed up. I should be seeing hundreds of chat messages coming in from everybody. So please post, tell us who you are, tell us why you're here, tell us what excites you about plant health and One Health. I can see Mozambique, Philippines, Thailand. We should be getting dozens of messages. Casablanca, welcome, good. I have no idea what time it is in Casablanca, Malaysia. Excellent. So let's just, uh, Mali, very good. Uruguay, Zurich, we're getting a nice global contribution. Tell us who you are. Tell us what is it that excites you about plant and One Health today. Yeah, One Health is one of those big buzzwords, but today we're going to be introducing you to the notion it's not just about animals and people and ecosystems, it's also about plants. So post in the chat, tell us who you are. Tell us what you're interested in. What is it that excites you about plants and One Health? And we're going to get going. It's exactly two o'clock GMT. So we're happy to see you here. Please keep on posting. I can see the chat messages coming in. Ashley, very good. Oh, it's your food and your work. I like that. That's very good. Plants and, yeah, excellent. So keep on posting. Tell us what it is that's exciting you about plant and One Health. Um, there are 150 people. Uh, I'm hearing some uh, some background, some background uh, Tunde. Keep on typing in. Tell us why you're here. Tell us who you are. That's a good introduction. Okay, we're going to get going. Um, just to remind you, this is the, the the third webinar in the CGIR International Year of Plant Health webinar series. We're talking about plant health for One Health. We're looking at the intersections of plants, humans, animals, and ecological health. So I'm going to, my name is Peter Ballantyne. My job is just to help with the process as we move along. We're going to go through. There's a few technical tips here to remind you, just in case you're not a frequent Zoom user. Most important is we'll be using the chat a lot. So please get the hang of the chat and we'll be recording everything. So please be careful if you're sending private messages on the chat. So. As we're getting warmed up, please tell us who you are, post in the chat. You will see many other colleagues have already done so. Tell us who you are. What is it that excites you about Plant and One Health? Let's have a look and see what's happening, who's coming in. We were seeing lots of people from, from Asia. I'm wondering whether we're getting, uh, we're getting India. I don't know whether we've got many people from the Western Hemisphere. I'm looking to see that. Yep. But we're seeing some nice, I can see Washington DC, excellent. So tell us why you're here. Let me just go now into the substance of the meeting. The CGIR has been running a series of these webinars. This is the fourth one. It's also the last one. Um, we've had, uh, we started off in, in, in midwinter here in Scotland. It was snowing and today we have the spring. So it's really the, the One Health and the spring are coming together. The focus is One Health and Plant Health. We have a really great um, set of speakers, a great set of, of, uh, of people going to be speaking with us today. And we're going to be informing you. We're hoping to illustrate some of the issues, the opportunities, the challenges. We want to inspire you to really take action and follow up. And we hope that you will interact. And we'll be using especially the, the, um, the chat to do that. It makes it easier for us to capture all the key points. And it's easier to manage from a, from a, from a process point of view. So please be interacting and interactive and help us as we go through the process. What do you expect to do today? We have 90 minutes. We have six brief presentations around some key issues. We're going to spend time in breakout groups. We're going to break you out into four different groups to go a bit deeper into some of the specific issues that are arising. We really want you to be active in your listening and interaction. We don't just want you to sit back and, and you know, have us in the background. We need you to be here with us. Please be very active on the chat. Post comments, post questions, post reactions. As we go along all the time, don't worry about if someone's speaking or not, just go ahead and do the chat. We will be sharing back, we'll be capturing, reflecting on the chat. We have a, an expert, fabulous technical moderator who will be you know, helping us to reflect and, and think critically. So in feedback, please. This um, Zoom meeting is also being uh, streamed on YouTube. So special welcome to you all. We're very happy that you're here, and we'll, we hope you can also participate by, by typing into the, the chat on the YouTube. So just a quick word on the chat. 
it's a really important way for us in these webinars to really solicit inputs and ideas and have conversations. So we really appreciate you giving your active contributions. It's not a place to apply for jobs. So please, you know, if you want to interact and talk to people, make connections, that's fine. But it's not really a job board. Um, we don't provide any attendance certificates. In the very first webinar, we had a lot of people saying we want to have an attendance certificate. It's just a certificate. It's just a webinar for people who really care about the subject. So no attendance certificates. So please be really respectful. We will be, we are now almost 200 people. So please be respectful of others and um, let's, let's have a really good conversation today. I want to just show this, this slide to show you that we have a very um, active, broad group of people who've been organizing this webinar behind the scenes. They come from different CGIR centers and beyond the CGIR. And I um, just want to appreciate, express my, our appreciation for all of you. You'll be seeing, I think, and hearing from almost all of them as we go through today. So that is the, the, the organizing group. So I think I need to go now and just briefly introduce the agenda. We're now at the phase of a warm up. We're going to show you in a moment a short video. We're going to have the presentations. We'll have that round table where our moderator and the speakers will, will dig, dig deeper. We'll go into smaller groups and we'll do a wrap up. And we should finish at 15.30 GMT. So that's the agenda. I am going to stop sharing my slide now. And I'm hoping that Tundi is ready with his video. Tundi. Yep. We should be getting a video now, a short video, super. It is estimated that by 2050, the world will have 9 billion people. How can we sustainably feed and support all these people while safeguarding our natural resources and the environment that we depend on for our very existence? not to mention amidst a climate that is rapidly changing. The global community, including CGIAR, are calling for a One Health approach that brings together multidisciplinary teams to work together at the local, national, and global levels to find holistic solutions to these and other complex challenges. What is the One Health approach? The One Health approach is a simple yet powerful concept all living things from the tiniest microorganism, plants and animals are inextricably linked with each other and with their shared environment, including the air, soil, and water. As human beings, we are healthier and better off when our crops, natural environments, and the animals around us are healthy. When the food we eat is nutritious and safe from microbial and chemical hazards. These complex problems affecting people, animals, and the environment are best tackled through integrated One Health investments and policies that unite and apply expertise in the ecology, including sectors of plant science, human and veterinary health. Plant health in One Health. Plant health is key in the One Health approach and efforts to achieve food security and zero hunger and reduce poverty by ensuring access to safe, nutritious foods and feed and improving livelihoods and poverty reduction. This leaves millions of people without enough food to eat or results in lost income and wasted resources. We need to pay as much attention to plant health as human and animal health in the One Health concept. Improved plant health will benefit human, animal, and environmental health. Given the central role that women play in agriculture and environmental stewardship, ensuring that women's goals and constraints are considered in the design of One Health programming is critical to its success. The One Health approach has the potential for creating win-win-win outcomes for people, animals, and the natural environment. It holds great promise in helping us to restore our connectivity with our natural world and create a better future for the next generation. Tunde, thank you, our colleagues from IITA who put that together with the, with the collaborators. So good. That gives us a nice setting for what this is all about. And I think when I want to introduce now our moderator, thank you, moderator for today, um, Professor Jeff uh, Barke. He's at, I couldn't think of somebody better qualified. He started off working 
as a cr crop protection specialist working with cassava mealybug, with locusts. So he's really coming from the area of plant health and plant protection. But he's now a professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He looks at the interfaces between agriculture and public health, really looking at those interdisciplinary collaborations, exactly why we're here today. And he's looking at looking for ways to optimize how plant public health outcomes can be uh, achieved from food systems. He's also closely associated with the CGIR research program on agriculture for nutrition and health. So Jeff, over to you. Um, if I, I hope I haven't shortchanged you on the introduction, but looking forward to a great afternoon. Thank you, Peter. That was very generous. And, uh, and hello, everyone. Um, welcome to this webinar on plant health for One Health. Um, as Peter mentioned, this is the last webinar in a series. It's uh, it's one a series which has explored areas that relate to plant health in terms of climate change, germplasm development, integrated pest management. But this final event really takes us to a big level. It's relating plant health to the health of other systems which we seek to protect as we carefully develop agriculture to meet future demands. And we've decided to use One Health as a framing concept of this webinar. I think we've had a good introduction in the video about what One Health means. Um, it's basically a way of approaching public health and well-being that recognizes the interconnections between people, animals, plants, and their shared environment. And I think it's useful to have a bit of history uh, as an introduction to this webinar. The One Health concept was developed originally to improve responses to human diseases that originate in livestock and wildlife, zoonotic diseases like brucellosis, Ebola, and COVID-19. And to do this, it engineered the intersectoral collaboration of veterinary and public health researchers, which was able to improve the response to these complex intersectoral problems. It involved finding common languages, finding common approaches, bringing stakeholders together so that these intersectoral solutions could be found. Now, more recently, One Health as a concept has been broadened to include not just human and animal health, but the health of the environment as well, acknowledging the changes in natural and agricultural ecosystems affect many processes that influence human health outcomes. So it is logical to include plant health today in a One Health concept, but this is an area which has actually been very little explored. As with earlier applications of One Health, the anticipated value of looking at plant health through a One Health lens is to create better, more inclusive, more intersectoral approaches to dealing with plant health interventions that address agricultural needs but that also realize co-benefits for environmental and human health outcomes. And perhaps longstanding challenges such as the health and environmental impacts of agricultural chemicals may find new solutions through such an integrative process. So today we brought together a unique and diverse group of expert panelists to help us link plant health and One Health. And there'll be plenty of opportunity, as Peter said, for your inputs, and those inputs will be really valuable in helping to prepare a report on this webinar that we hope will shape future dialogue across plant and one health. Now to start our session, we're gonna have a series of presentations and they will start with the big picture, how the future crop production and protection might influence the health of ecosystems and through this, our own health. And then we're going to focus down on the complexity of interactions between crops, animals, environments, and human health. Looking first at drugs and antimicrobial resistance and then at agrochemicals. And we'll then move to talks that look at processes that improve the health outcomes of plant production and protection, first with respect to pesticides and then with respect to food safety in food chains. And finally, we'll be asked to consider the highly gendered nature of health impacts and outcomes arising from plant production and plant protection, which reflects the different roles that women and men play in agriculture. So let's begin. Um, and I'd like to introduce our first speaker. So may I introduce um, Professor Navin Ramakoti, who's the Canada Research Chair in Global Environmental Change and Food Security at the University of British Columbia in Canada. Navin. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, today, I'd like to bring a global perspective to you. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the global environment and planetary health. Next slide, please, Peter. There are three major challenges facing humanity um, in terms of agriculture. 
So today we have about 800 million people undernourished and maybe 2 billion people who are malnourished and suffering from micronutrient deficiencies. At the same time, as the introductory video said, we need more food in the uh, future because of increasing population as well as increasing consumption. At the same time, agriculture is already a major threat to planetary health, as Jeff alluded to. With climate change, 34% of greenhouse gas emissions, so a third of our climate change problem is a, res is a result of agriculture and the food system. Uh, with biodiversity loss, agriculture is the biggest driver of biodiversity loss for birds for which we have really good data. It's shown that 30% of threats to birds that are going extinct is from agriculture. Agriculture is also the biggest user of fresh water on this planet, um, uses 85% of consumptive use, mainly for irrigation. And agriculture is also the biggest polluter of fresh water on this planet, 86% um, of nitrogen and nearly all of the phosphorus uh, that we apply on our, um, on our fields runs off into aquatic ecosystems causing algal blooms and um, what's known as uh, hypoxia. So it's key that it's, it's clear that agriculture is key to both human and planetary health. Um, on top of all of this, we have a fourth problem, which is that climate change is making all of these challenges even harder. Next slide, please. So today the concept I was asked to introduce is on sustainable intensification. And it's the idea that can, you know, can we make our farming better? Um, and the question typically asked is, is, can we increase our food production at lower environmental costs? There's two ways of increasing production. One is through expanding area and through, or through increasing intensification in yields. And generally speaking, people think that expanding area is not a good idea because you're then encroaching into new habitat, causing more greenhouse gas emissions and biodiversity loss. And so generally sustainable intensification focuses on increasing yields, increasing the productivity of agriculture at lower environmental costs. And again, there may be different ways of getting at it. The idea of sustainable intensification doesn't care about how you get it. It's about the outcome itself. But we could achieve this outcome through increasing the efficiency of conventional farming. So for example, by changing uh, farm management practices through mulching or applying split fertilizers um, to make it more efficient, to get more crop per drop, for example, or through um, increases in improvements in technology using precision agriculture, for example. Another approach may be to, through transitioning to alternative farming itself. So people say we, we need to uh, have a revolution. We need to switch away from conventional farming systems towards organic or agroecological agro practices. Next slide, please. So in my work, uh, a lot of my work has been to try to assess what, what's the potential for these different pathways, different solutions to achieve the outcomes that we want. Um, here are two examples, and the first column shows sustainable intensification, and the second one shows organic agriculture. And across the rows are the different objectives, the outcomes that we would like to have. On the top row, it's food, and the others are the environmental outcomes. And what's probably clear from looking at this is that there are trade-offs. Um, so with sustainable intensification through you know, conventional food production system, we can certainly increase food, and we can produce it very efficiently. So in this case, for example, we can increase food production by 30% with only a 9% increase in nitrogen application rate. So that's a very efficient way of you know, producing our food. Um, but that's still a trade-off in the sense that we are producing more food at an environmental cost. On the other hand, when we look at organic agriculture, some, of, some studies have shown that organic can have lots of environmental benefits and actually also nutritional and health benefits, but it has lower yields. So there's a trade-off. So how can we move forward um, in, in the future to achieve planetary health um, while we have these trade-offs? That's the question that we'll come to. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, we've got a number of, um, of polls that we're gonna run with audience participation. I'm gonna hand over to Peter for that, for this particular talk. Thank you very much, Jeff. Okay, yes. So we wanted you to be, as part of this active listening, we're going to have you do some active um, voting and some participation. So what we've got here are the first poll, and Navin has asked us to, you will see here three pairs of options. We want you to choose one from each pair of options, yeah? So, so um, I think you can see already the poll has been posted. Uh, do I have to stop sharing my screen? Maybe I do. Um, so you should be seeing the poll. We want you all to vote, please. 
You choose from uh, choose from one of the ones, one of the twos, or one of the threes. You should be making three choices. And we, you have about another uh, 20 seconds. We want to do it quite quickly. I can see that only 3% of us have voted. So take a look. Look at each one. This is quite a complicated poll. You have to make three choices. But we're very happy that, um, that, that you can try that all out. We can see now that uh, we've got 17% of us have voted. So let's take another 10, 20 seconds to see how we get on. We're doing well. And then I'm, I don't know, in a moment we will share the results. And then I think that Jeff and Navin will tell us what they are seeing. So we're up to 43% of you have voted, 46. So when we get to uh, when we get to 50 percent, we're over 50 percent now. So I think um, Tunde, let's close the poll and let's see what the results are. Jeff, can you right. see the results? The Navin? I see the results. See Very it? interesting. Well, you know, when I was watching people coming in on the uh, on the chat, I noticed that we had a real mix of agriculture and health related people. And I think uh, I'm, I'm seeing that the message here is a healthy planet, food sovereignty, and agroecological approaches sort of trump. Um, food security and technology, which is sort of an interesting result. And maybe that reflects the diversity of the, of the, of the group we have here. But, but Navin, what do you think about this sort of pattern compared to the, the other communities you've engaged with this complicated trade-off message? Uh, I mean, I, I think the pattern uh, matches exactly what I see in other communities. Uh, I do find that there's usually a split in these different approaches and that split shows up here, except uh, with a slight, you know, uh, shift towards more food sovereignty and agroecological approaches. I think that voice is being increasingly heard. Um, I'm also find it interesting, not that many people voted for the second question, uh, but there are marginally more people who voted that we do need increased food production by 2050 compared to having enough mm. food already. So I, I found that interesting too, because a lot of the people who also, uh, who usually focus on food sovereignty and agroecology usually also say that we have enough food already. Uh, so I'm, inter I'm interesting to see that pattern. Mm. You know, there's been a, a debate for many, many years. You know, is it distribution or production? Do we have enough that we just need to spread it around? It's it's interesting. That still is an area that a lot of people are scratching their heads about. So we, we exactly. should be showing that the results are not on the screen. Are, they? are the results on the screen? They are. As far as we've got, I think that 50%. Yeah, yeah. Can all the users, can everybody see? Tundi, I wasn't sure whether the participants could see the results. So we can see them now. Okay. Um, I'm not sure how we find out. I think they're all visible now. That was the, yeah, that's what we were are. talking about. We can share them. We will share them afterwards anyway. Good. So I think we can now. They're great. Thank you, Chris. Christopher Butler, thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, so I think we have to make sure we share them with you. So that was the results we just talked about. Good. We're going to have to move on. So I'm going to go back and share my screen now, Jeff, so we can move to your next. That's grand. Okay. And um, and Naman escaped my, my bell. <laughs> which I'm going to ring when four minutes are up, but he did it because he was very quick. So uh, just to the other speakers coming, uh, just to keep us on time. So um, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Russo Juaka. He's a molecular entomologist. That's an interesting profession, who leads an agriculture platform at the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture. And uh, I'll pass the wrong sequence. Your oh, I'm sorry. I've, I've gotten the wrong order, excuse me. <laughs> okay, our next speaker um, is Dr. Arshini Moodley, a microbiologist and an expert on antimicrobial resistance who leads the CGIR's Antimicrobial Resistance Hub at the International Livestock Research Institute in Kenya. My apologies, over to you, Arshini. Thank you very much, Jeff, no worries. Um, so good evening, everybody from Nairobi, Kenya, and um, let's go into the next slide already, Peter, please. So one of the things that, that I'm going to talk to you about today is about uh, using antimicrobial resistance as an example of a, of a challenge that we face both in livestock production as well as in plant uh, 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 crop production and human health. So what are antimicrobials and why do we care about them? Well, firstly, they have revolutionized medicine as in their very critical uh, sort of medicines that we use to treat infections, both in animals, humans, and plants. And an example of an antimicrobial will be uh, antibiotics like penicillin. And really what it's done is means that we've been able to live longer. Our life expectancies have increased as well as our ability to produce more food. But it comes at a, at a compromise because uh, by using these antimicrobials, what happens is that we promote antimicrobial resistance that over time, 
the effect of antimicrobial resistance will be that they are no longer effective. So this means we cannot treat infections. We do not have the curing effect of these very vital drugs. And so for humans, the impacts of antimicrobial resistance would be mo increased morbidity and mortality and also economic uh, uh, increases in terms of healthcare costs. In agriculture, the effect would ultimately be reduced productivity, reduced output, less food being produced. Uh, and if agriculture, and since agriculture is so closely linked to livelihoods and and food security, that antimicrobial resistance would be devastating if we're not able now to produce the, amount, the food that Nevin was just talking about that we need to be producing more of. So another concept that we're going to talk about today is about zoonoses. And essentially this is the spread of, zoono of zoonotic pathogens, including antimicrobial resistance from animals to humans. Uh, and this could either be by direct contact or through food or indirectly through food, water or common environment. And here I want you to think about salmonella and eggs or for example, tapeworm in pork. And we say that a AMR is one of those quintessential one health problems and I'm gonna hopefully convince you why. Next slide please, Peter. I think it's important to remember is that we live in very complex connected ecosystems. We are connected by the food that we eat, the water that we drink or swim in, for example, and wildlife. And wildlife, not necessarily elephants and, uh, uh, and rhinos like here where I live in, in Kenya, but it could also be rats on a farm or birds that are sort of flying over a farm, settle and then fly on to a different, uh, a different farm or a different country altogether. And we already know that we use the same antibiotics or antimicrobials in, in the different production systems, animals, humans, and, uh, and plants and that there is already resistance that is spreading, that is in those different sectors and spreading between the sectors. And another important thing is that resistance is able to travel from one country to another. Uh, and an important concept that we need to consider when we're looking at how interventions. Next slide, please. Next slide, thank you. So here I've just tried to kind of illustrate the problem or the connectiveness between the different sectors when we think about where are these drugs being used and what could be the flow of resistance between one sector to the other. And really the sector that we're going to be focusing on in this talk is this part here. But one of the important things to consider is that almost two thirds of the global use of antibiotics is in livestock production. And this is expected to double within the next 10 years. Another important thing to note is that depending on the antibiotic, anywhere between 30 or 90% of that antibiotic when you treat an animal will be excreted in its urine or feces as an unmetabolized compound. And so what is the effect of that in terms of manure that is then going on to be used to fertilize uh, as a fertilizer in crops or contamination of crop products that then go that enter the food chain? Uh, and that's what we're going to really talk about. But the rest of the other bubbles that I have here is to think about other ways in which antibiotic residues as well as antibiotic resistant genes or organisms can enter the different sectors and then spread between the different sectors, which I think is incredibly important uh, when we think about interventions as well. Next slide, please. What I really want here to spend a, a little bit of time here is to really try to unpack this connectiveness between livestock production, crop production, as well as then the impacts on human health. So the blue is, is a farm, what can happen on a farm. Green is the environment, which also includes where crops are growing. And then on the bottom right-hand side is the household that is going to be eating uh, uh, fruits and vegetables. So if we concentrate on the blue bits, you have uh, animals, and I can tell you that in a uh, it, it, an adult cattle can produce up to 25 kilograms of fresh dung a day and 21 liters of urine a day. So you can imagine the amount of urine and feces is being produced on a daily basis from animals depending on the, on a farm, and it depends on the number of animals you have and how you feed the animals. Uh, we know that antibiotics are used here. So now you're going to have all of this urine and feces that is then going to contain a lot of the residues as well as resistant organisms. So what happens to these, uh, these byproducts of livestock production? Well, depending on what country you live in, it could either just be dumped directly into the environment. So suddenly you have all of these residues and all of these resistant genes and pathogens being dumped into the environment. And we'll talk about what will be the effect of that in terms of 
if you have livestock that are suddenly uh, grazing uh, in the common environment, or you have wildlife that are also interacting and picking up these resistant genes and then transferring it to another location because they migrate, or a water hole that is used both by animals and humans, uh, as well as the wildlife. The other thing is to consider is that this manure that we have produced, a lot of farmers can keep it and produce the fertilizer that will then go on to be used to fertilize the crops. There are other ways or methods of managing manure uh, that a farmer can uh, implement on his farm, and this will then reduce the risks associated with antimicrobial resistance. A sort of another thing that we have neglected in the past, but really trying to understand more and more now, is what is this impact of antibiotic usage in crop production? So data is coming out to suggest that yes, antibiotics are used, albeit not at the same amounts that we use in animals and humans, but nonetheless a consideration to think about when we think about One Health approaches to address antimicrobial resistance. And so ultimately what you have is that you have uh, products, crop products, that then are, can be contaminated by residues as well as resistant organisms. And depending on what country you live in, uh, you either eat it raw. I mean, I, we eat a lot of raw vegetables at home. As I said, I'm a vegetarian. Um, and so we don't cook them. So there's no process in which we could kill a lot of the bacteria or, or residues. So what is that impact when I consume a product that is uh, contaminated with these residues and resistant genes, for example? And next slide, please. So one of the ways in which in high income countries, we've been looking at how to reduce the AMR risk from agriculture to humans, there's a number of different uh, initiatives, policies, uh, 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 sort of in, uh, that we can, interventions that we can do in order to reduce either the usage, because usage of antimicrobials is the driver of resistance. But the other thing one needs to consider is how do you reduce the transmission between the different sectors? We cannot stop using antibiotics because that is not the reality. Um, yes, we can reduce it by doing very many different things, uh, but one of the things is that, yes, we use it, we're going to have resistance, but how do we manage this transmission? And the, on the left-hand side, the two, uh, the yellow and the green uh, boxes, they really have been what has been implemented mainly in high-income countries, a number of initiatives. But on the right side, I tried to highlight some of the challenges we faced in low- and middle-income countries that really make it difficult for us or challenging for us to implement the, the green and yellow boxes. And really what we're trying to do is to, in our setting, is to really understand what is the gaps, what is the, ev and generate the evidence in order to fill that gaps to come up with policies and solutions that fit the context in which we, uh, we, I work in, or most of us live in, and whether those interventions can then be scaled up and ultimately reduce resistance, uh, ending up in the human population. And one of the things I think is manure and management of wastewater. Thank you. Thank you, Arshni. That was great. And um, we're going to move on to the next talk, um, and then we're going to have another poll. So um, the next talk is a man who needs no introduction, because I've already introduced him, um, Rusa Juaka from IITA. Um, Rusa is a molecular entomologist, as I mentioned, and works in agri-health problems. And I'll pass over to you now, Rusa, and a four-minute warning will be wrong, as with all the others. Okay. Over to you. Hello. Okay, great. So, so thank you so much, uh, Jeff, for introducing me. And uh, actually, the presentation I have to do is to address agrochemicals misuse and overuse in plant health using a one health approach. Uh, uh, actually, there are two uh, important things to to mention before this presentation is that one, the, the one head recognizes that life, life is not segmented. And secondly, the one health also recognizes that there's an interconnectivity between human health, plant health, and environmental health. So having said this, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. It should be there, I uh, think. Okay. Great. Okay, fine. So, so having said this, 
you, uh, uh, this slide actually presents the, the connection between uh, a, a human health and the environment. Let's take, for example, the, the first action that humans uh, can pose in the environment, like uh, the use of agrochemicals. And you can see here pesticides, which are transferred into the environment for, for, for pest controls in plant health. And from that action of, the, of humans into the environment, you can see a robust reaction of uh, the environment by, by uh, sending uh, the residues of this pesticide uh, into water, into food and drinking water, and also resistant mosquitoes. Actually, what happened with resistant mosquitoes is that when the agrochemical get into the environment, they get into contact with mosquitoes and mosquitoes be in contact with these agrochemicals will also develop a resistance. And now this will, this will therefore make the, the, the control of disease uh, like vector borne disease or mosquito borne disease more complex because mosquitoes like malaria, because mosquitoes have developed resistance. And that is a strong and a robust reaction of uh, the environment coming from that action of pesticide uh, spread for plant health. The, the, the reaction of the environment will not just stop there. Next slide. Next slide. The reaction of the environment will not just stop there in the sense that the environment will also react, uh, will, will again react by, by uh, by contaminating water and food with the same pesticide, water and food, uh, uh, water and food taken by, by animal will be contaminated by the same pesticide residues during the grazing and during pastoralism. And when, when the water and the food is, uh, uh, is contaminated, as you can see in this picture, the animal will now through their feces and their urine, they will recontaminate the environment through those pesticide residues. And the, the, the other series of action and, and reaction will be known from the animal back to humans. Next slide. In this next cascade of reaction, you can actually see that the, the, the animals are going to send to humans through their meats, uh, through their meats or through their dairy products, uh, uh, um, food which is contaminated with the, with the pesticide residues and with the heavy metals and also with AMR. And for those using uh, fertilizers, organic fertilizers like feces or urine for fertilizing their crops, the, these feces will also be contaminated with uh, the same residues, pesticide residues. And it is important to mention at this point that all these elements are also exacerbated by uh, climate changes uh, and in the presence of uh, climatic variations, these uh, uh, interactions between the, the three components will be strongly affected as well. Next slide. So, so this other slide actually show the complexity of, uh, of managing pesticide uh, uh, residues or managing agrochemicals in general. And you can see the series of actions and reactions between the, the environment, uh, between human, the environment and animal following agrochemical treatments. You can also see still on this same slide, you can see drivers of uh, agrochemicals. Like between humans and environments, you have uh, a plant health, uh, plant health or plant treatment uh, and food security, which is a strong driver of, of agrochemicals. On the other hand, you have uh, pastoralism and grazing, which is another strong driver of uh, agrochemicals between environments and animals. And between animals and humans, you have another strong driver which, uh, of agrochemicals, which is livestock and husbandry and the use of organic uh, fertilizers. So this picture, uh, this slide is actually showing the complexity of the phenomenon for managing agrochemicals and the series of actions and reactions and the interconnectivities between human, the environment and the uh, animals. Next slide. So from, so from this complexity, it is worth to indicate at this point that, uh, talking, uh, uh, that we cannot just be talking of agrochemicals management. It becomes now interesting to talk of the science of agriculture chemical management. So how to do a sustainable management of agrochemicals. 
and it is important to bring on board several expertise. And one of the expertise will be doing the mapping of uh, these agrochemicals into various systems, then to identify the drivers of agrochemical transports. Other expertise needed in this type of uh, uh, activities will be to model specialists, uh, uh, it will be modelers uh, for, for simulating and to determine the drivers which are having higher impacts. Then the evaluation of these drivers, m &E, it will be important to, to evaluate the impact of this, uh, uh, these interventions. And very important would also be to uh, the stakeholders, the various stakeholders to bring them together for the sound that will bring them together for action, decision-making and policy-making. So all these will be important if you want to sustainably manage agrochemicals in plant treatments. Thank you so much. Thank you, Russo. That was excellent. Um, so we've had two talks just now, which have, have laid out the real challenge of um, understanding the complex relationships that, that drive in one case antimicrobials, another through pesticides, through all these environmental um, sectors, plants, animals, humans, environment. And, and I think it's clear from the fantastic diagrams we've seen that we, we're getting a handle on what the pattern is, where things can go, what the interactions could be. I guess where we're stuck still is knowing exactly how strong are those and what are the critical ones. But all of you come from many different disciplines. And so I'm gonna hand over to, to Peter for a poll, which actually, um, tries to gather your views on what you think are the most important kinds of, of um, sources of plant protection risks in all of these complex networks in which we should prioritize to invest in plant health for One Health. So over to you, Peter. Hey, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, everybody. Tunde, could you put the poll up, please? So you should be, get, you should be seeing on your screen in a minute the poll. So yes, um, if you could now take the vote. This time, you only have to make one choice. There's no three choices. Just make one choice. Tell us which of these should be prioritized, plant health or one health, having heard from Arshini and Russo. So let's keep on going. We're up to 14%. We're looking for a 50% uh, response rate. Um, so if you can take the poll, I'm seeing we're up to 27, 28%. We need you to vote. Please tell us which of these is the most important. If one of these is not on the list, what are your idea? Post it for us in the chat. We're really counting on you to post in the chat. Tell us what your thoughts are. We're up to 46, 47%. So that's very good, 50%. We're going to go, I think, Tunde, we can close the polling. I'm going to share the results. We're going to share the results. So everybody should be seeing the results now on the screen. Jeff, can you see them? I can see them. Thank you, okay. Peter. What are we seeing? What's... Uh... Well, we're, we're seeing... We're, it started off quite skewed towards better coordination. Um, and then we saw the others creep up a little bit. And I think it's still the, the major um, view here is that we need to better coordinate this use, possibly recognizing that we can't eliminate it from all these without it having problems. Um, but um, Russo, uh, what's, what's your impression of this as well? And particularly, I want to ask you in terms of um, better coordination, what do you see from your experience as, the, as one of the key priorities for coordinating between these different sectors in terms of agrochemical use? Uh, yes, I'm quite, uh, I'm quite happy to see this type of result because this is actually what uh, is coming out from uh, the, the presentation as well. Uh, it's like uh, you can actually see all the three sectors, the, the human, the animal, and the, plant, and the plant sectors who have to come together and uh, is having the highest percentage of uh, scores. So there's a need for strong coordination and to make actually the management of agrochemical holistic. And the second driver, and the second point, which is also very interesting uh, and which is captivating, is to identify and control ag uh, drivers of agrochemicals. This is also very important because we all know that we cannot stop using agrochemicals. So it is important to know which are the, the, the main drivers and how to articulate on this driver for sustainable use of agrochemicals. This is really fantastic from what I'm seeing here in these results. Great. That's what I can say for now. Great. Thanks very much. That's fantastic. That's, that's, that's a good a good poll. So uh, thank you, Russo. Thank you, Arshini. Let's move on. Now, Peter, could you show the, the title slide for the next talk? And I'll, I'll, I'll use that. Um, because um, everyone, we, and sadly, one of our speakers uh, had serious connectivity problems and can't speak. So I'm going to give a very 
short precy of, of uh, what he was to speak about. This is Dr. Elikana Lakai, who's an expert on pesticides um, and recently retired as a principal scientist at the Tropical Products Research Institute in Tanzania. And unfortunately, they've just had uh, real difficulty connecting um, today. Uh, but he did. we do have his talk. And I'm going to give you a very quick run through that because it fits into our broader discussion. So um, his talk was on the experience of pesticide regulation. And uh, basically on this first slide, what we see here is um, in the green, the way in which pesticides uh, appear and available to farmers through registration, formulation, importation. And then what happens once they're, they're in the field, they're sale, they're used, they're used in farm and waste management. It's effectively a, a life cycle and it's a life cycle because we constantly introduce new pesticides as old ones become um, either banned or ineffective due to resistance. Next slide. And what Elikana was going to, to share with us was the challenges and the ways to address those challenges in terms of pesticide use in his experience in Africa. Um, uh, I think you can read these. I'm not going to go through them all, um, but clearly it's, it's, a, it's a shortage of, of resources. It's, um, it's an accumulation of, of obsolete pesticides, problems of counterfeit, um, misuse, and lack of training. And uh, as he points out in the red here, there are a lot of different ways to address that. And he concludes that the ways forward include um, strengthening the enforcement power. And we'll come back to that a little bit later in our meeting. You know, that's sort of the, how do we regulate the use of pesticides? Um, reduce reliance on certain kinds of pesticides, strengthen the capacity to, to measure their health effects and laboratories for that. Um, and a lot of other more technical ones that I won't go into. And he comes up with a final message, which is the next slide that effective pesticide law enforcement and pesticide management are essential tools for risk reduction in human and environmental health. So I've by no means done justice to Dr. Lakai, um, but I hope that uh, that has gone in because it's gonna be part of our subsequent discussions. We think about um, how we actually get around to doing something about this. This talk is, is one of those. And the next talk will also address, you know, what evidence do we have about interventions and their ability to be effective in reducing health risks from plant protection. So um, let me now introduce our next speaker. Um, Dr. Vivian Hoffman is an economist, a food safety expert, and a senior research fellow at the International um, Food Policy Research Institute. She's based in Kenya. And uh, she's gonna give us uh, a talk on managing plant associated hazards where regulatory capacity is weak. Vivian. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, so foodborne, oh, right, jump right into the next slide, please. Okay, so foodborne disease is a major contributor to ill health and premature death worldwide. In fact, the total estimated foodborne disease burden through plant foods alone is almost as high in terms of years of healthy life lost as that of maternal mortality and related illness. So most foodborne disease is caused by gut pathogens <clears throat> but heavy metals are also important, as are fungal toxins like aflatoxin. The figures plotted here, I note, are lower bounds of the true health costs of foodborne disease, because they include only those conditions for which there's very strong causal evidence. For example, the likely role of aflatoxins in child stunting is not included in this graph. Next uh, slide, please. Most of the health hazards that are found in plant foods originate on farm and manure, you know, pathogens through manure is an important example of that that Arshni touched on. Um, so with collaborators in Kenya, Ghana and the US, IFPRI has conducted a series of studies to understand how to encourage better on farm practices. <clears throat> Now, the results on this slide are from a trial in northern Ghana, where randomly selected groundnut farmers were given information about how to prevent aflatoxin contamination. Um, others were given free tarps to use for drying their groundnuts as one intervention that works very well. And a final group was offered a price premium for aflatoxin safe nuts. We tested impacts on four different sets of post-harvest practices and impacts on drying practices are circled in red since providing tarps uh, targeted drying directly. We found that information alone improved some practices, but that those, <clears throat> that, but mostly those that didn't require a cash outlay. 
providing free tarps, of course, improved drying, but also improved other practices like sorting out visibly damaged nuts and use of better storage techniques. The price incentive improved practices too, including costly ones. Next slide. So information and, sub and technology subsidies and markets are all effective. Um, but we also wanted to know, okay, seeing as the market incentives are effective, how can we make those market incentives happen? How can we strengthen them? Um, since we know that regulatory capacity is generally quite weak in countries where foodborne disease claims the most lives, one strategy could be to create voluntary private certification systems. Food companies could use these to signal their superior safety and draw consumers away from their competitors. However, in an experiment shown here, where maize, a maize flour brand in Kenya was promoted based on third-party verification of its food safety protocols, we found that while sales initially increased in response to, to advertising this way, the response faded in a matter of weeks after the end of the marketing campaign, eventually went back down to control levels. After the study was over, in fact, the company we worked with stopped using the food safety label because they weren't always able to source safe raw materials and also using the label increased scrutiny from regulators. Next slide, please. However, another study shows a more hopeful result and that is um, that this is also in maize flour in Kenya, um, we found that those brands with better name recognition are much more likely to be compliant with the national food safety standard for aflatoxin. Now, none of these brands use food safety claims in their marketing, but their managers that we interviewed said that they pay attention to food safety because a mandatory government recall can destroy a brand's reputation. Smaller firms tend Smaller firms tend to compete on price rather than reputation, so they're not as vulnerable to this threat, and they just offer cheaper and less safe food. From this study, we conclude that even weakly enforced regulations can be a very effective tool for improving food safety, at least for a segment of the market, and that segment could potentially be expanded with more capacity building. To conclude, food safety is a serious public health issue, um, and support for capacity building of farmers and food, food business operators to comply with safety regulations, as well as enforcement of those regulations, will be required to improve it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Vivian. That was really interesting. Um, and what we'd like to do now is go to another poll, uh, both from taking a bit of uh, what I summarized from Dr. Lakai's talk and from Vivian's talk basically about um, how in food value chains we can address food safety threats from things like pesticides and, and, uh, and other factors uh, that Vivian mentioned. So that's, that's the question. And I'll over, go over to Peter for the poll. Sure, thanks, Jeff. So here we go, folks. You have the, the, five, the five options. If you don't want to go with one of the four, please post them in the chat. So tell us why, where in the food chains is it most effective to, to address these chats? And you should be voting now. We're up to 4%. We were looking for a 50% again. So please keep on voting. So then we can, uh, we can see where you, what you guys are thinking about. Keep on voting. Um, I'm not sure how far we've got. We're up to 36%. Uh, in a moment, we'll share the results. Um, I think Vivian and you should be able to see them. And Jeff will also be able to see them. But we're not there yet. 53%. So Tundi, I think we're good. 54 56% have voted. Tunde, give us a, okay, good. So are we, are we should be sharing, you should be seeing them on the screen, everybody. That is coming back again. Wow, yep. interesting results. Vivian, what are we seeing? <laughs> yeah, we're seeing, we're seeing it on the screen. We're seeing that on-farm education of farmers, making safe technology affordable is, is pretty much by far the major choice here, um, which is sort of interesting, I think. Uh, Vivian, a lot of your talk was was sort of spreading across the whole food chain. What is your view on on the uh, the efficacy of that approach as opposed to the sort of more more consumer based one? I mean, I, I tend to agree with this, and I think the results that I showed um, reflected this: that consumer based approaches only have limited reach, and people who care about food safety is certainly a segment of the population, but tend not to include the poorest consumers. And so, from an equity perspective, we really need to address the system and what the system provides. And when you start at the farm, you know that's where this, the problem starts. So we do need to begin there. The challenge, of course, is reaching all those farmers, and so <laughs> designing ways at which um, in which 
effort to actually educate and reward and um, enforce regulations is the hard part. I think we need to find the parts of the chain where, where food gets aggregated and, and then hope that some of those signals can make it back to farmers, as well as, as providing information and resources directly to farmers themselves, because there's just so many of them. Okay, great. Yeah, I think you're right, too. Though I, I have these interesting debates with my public health colleagues at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, um, and, and they focus around this question, who is responsible for ensuring the health of people from agriculture? Is it the responsibility of the farmer or the government or the consumer to look after their own consumption or the people who market and produce food? It's sort of an interesting question because um, uh, my public health people think, yeah, sure, it's the farmers. <laughs> uh, as an agriculturalist, I find that a little bit daunting. Um, so uh, maybe that's the topic for our further discussions in the breakouts. But we need to move on now to our final presentation. So um, I would like to introduce um, Professor Janice Olawoye, who is a recently retired professor of rural sociology at the University of Abaddon in Nigeria. And she's going to speak to us on um, gender for One Health, or people, plants, animals, and the environment. Janice, please. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, first of all, I, this must be a little bit brief and a little bit superficial given the time. But I do want to talk about the implications of gender for health of people, plants, animals, and the environment. And we all recognize now the significance of gender as being cross-cutting. That is, it is relevant for any topic, and it's generally recognized. Most people in any discipline accept the significance and are somewhat enlightened about what gender is and the need to integrate it, um, gender concerns, into any topical issue. This has not always been so, and it is good that it is now um, fully accepted. However, one problem still often arises as gender is often included as an afterthought. We can go to the next one. Thank you, Peter. Um, it's often included as an afterthought. A lot of times people will say, we know we need to include gender, so how do we try to fit it in? Indeed, for many scientists or scholars in areas of natural or physical or biological sciences, including agricultural sciences, people actually involved in the food chain or agri value chain from producers to processors to service providers to transporters to marketers are often ignored while researchers continue to seek to develop new hybrids, new techniques and technology improved agro inputs such as fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, storage chemicals. And when problems later arise that they don't adopt them, then issues of whether such are appropriate to the user or even who the proper target group may be, it becomes apparent that maybe the starting point should actually be the end user. So it is good that we are considering the people in the One Health approach, but we also recognize there are gender differences in the roles, constraints, responsibilities, and challenges for the male and female stakeholders. Gender roles are socially determined, and so they vary from one group to another, whether by ethnicity, religion, or locality. So a major point, point needs to be made here that gender roles must not be overgeneralized, because we look at a variety of plants grown in many different localities by many different groups. Gender roles, that is, what do men do, what do women do, from the point of production to consumption for specific commodities in specific areas. There is really so much diversity. So why is this important? Next slide, please. The main issue that needs to be stressed is that diversity of gender roles and constraints must be understood, researched, and recognized. We need to know what the gender roles and constraints are across localities and even different groups for different plants, different systems, some mixing livestock with crop farming and in different ecosystems. That is for perhaps in drier climates, it may increase the work stress for females. So we need to focus on gender diversity across commodities. Are we talking about maize or cassava? across status groups, that is, are we talking about poor or better off stakeholders? Across generations, are we talking about younger or older producers? And across value chains, from producers all the way to consumers. Who are the stakeholders at each point and who is doing what? 
It's not acceptable to say women do this or men do that. How do we protect the health of the people? And what do the people need to do to protect the health of plants, animals, environments, and other people? There are important policy considerations and action points as we design gender sensitive extension programs to cover the entire food chain. It's interesting that the poll shows the importance of education of farmers and the extent, of course, by, by that we mean agricultural extension. But do all farmers, in fact, do women have the luxury of choice, even if we give them information? From a gender perspective, one must consider which options are likely to be available for men and women. For women, it may not be a matter of choice as they might not be able to gain access to alternatives or to better options. If the information and resources are not available or accessible, it is not a matter of knowledge of which is best. Very often women are given lands which are less fertile and may likely be growing crops for household consumption rather than higher value uh, crops for sale. And I would like to stop here and also that we just lost electricity, so I will have to get an alternative as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Janice, just in time. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, well, that's very, uh, very interesting and very important. And I think we, we need to explore that through uh, another round of inputs. So this time, not a poll, um, I'm not sure many people would would have much to disagree with anything that, we, that you said, but rather to gather some some ideas from the chat. So I'm going to hand over to Peter for a in the chat exercise on this very issue of gender and one health and plant health. Peter. Um, okay, good. So I want you to to um, I don't want you to type the answer just yet. I want you to take 30 seconds to reflect on what you've heard and to reflect on the question below. And the question is looking across plant, animal, human, and environmental health, what action, action is most needed to improve gender and inclusion? And I want you to type your chat comment, but do not send it until I say go. So just take about 10 more seconds now, and we should have a wave of chat. And then I'm hoping, Jeff, that you will be able to serve the wave um, and anybody <laughs> else who is here. So I'm going to give you a, a countdown, and then I want everybody, please, to post all at once. So I'm going to give you a five, four, three, two, one, and post your chat messages, please. And there should be a couple of hundred of these chats coming in. And Jeff, you don't, I don't know whether you're going to be able to keep up with all of them, but let's see what's coming in. You should be seeing them coming in live. I'm seeing digital systems, diversity. What are we seeing? What are the actions? Um, is Janice still here? I don't know whether she can still... Yes, I'm, I'm going to call on Janice to help me here. Janice, <laughs> can you read them I'm coming here. in? I'm here. And can I we think see the chat is... messages pouring in? What are people saying? Okay. Education and we're seeing... Wow, I'm, I'm getting... I would. I, we started off with a lot of education, but we're talking... There's a lot of um, technological issues, awareness, but now it is really coming down to education and awareness. Yes. Indeed, indeed it is. And it's, uh, it's important that there are uh, targeted messages to um, especially females, but it has to be regarding what they are actually doing. Um, they don't need all information and much of the information that they do need, they may not be targeted to receive. And so it is very, very important that we do talk about education, awareness, extension, capacity building, all those things. But we need to, first of all, have the research, the knowledge of what they are doing in particular localities. What knowledge do they really need? What skills do they need? What technology do they need? Absolutely. Yeah, that's a very strong, positive and uh, pretty uniform response around, and, around capacity building education, awareness raising, and, and, uh, and, uh, and that's, so I think that's, that's a really good conclusion there. But, but may I say this, Jeff, Please. that even if you, uh, if someone is educated, but they don't have the tools and they don't have the resources mm -hmm. and they don't have the opportunity, I mean, if they're still in a situation where um, the woman is given less fertile lands, and so uh, obviously she has greater constraints anyway, um, even if you do give them the education, but they don't have the choice, they don't have the resources to be able to um, to be able to enact what they've been taught, then they're still uh, not likely to be able to do what we would hope they would be able to do. 
Yes, Janice. Actually, as you were saying that, I was scrolling up looking for the word power. <laughs> and <laughs> find it. <laughs> so it's a really good point, isn't it? Yes, education has uh, got to go along with opportunity and, and, and uh, enti entitlement and, and so on. Yeah, so that's a fantastic and important point to end on, I think. Um, and we are now, Peter, I've got a question for you. We were now going to go into a bit of a discussion. We're running up against time. Do we have time for one Question. I think we should do five minutes. If we can do five minutes, would be great. Well, we more, more the challenge to the group than to me, but yeah. I did have a few thoughts. Um, and let me put a question to our panelists. Um, one thing that occurred to me. So in our first presentation, Navin described two possible agricultural futures, um, which we can perhaps loosely, if, if too loosely, call technological and agroecological. And I've noticed this has come up in a number of the chat points as well, that we sort of take a technological approach by default. Um, what might the implications of these two different potential futures mean for our one health and plant health scenarios? I don't think this is a simple question. For instance, um, in the area of soil fertility for plant health, uh, some new kinds of fertilizers or mechanism to increase soil fertility you know, nitrogen fixing and roots and so on, could have quite negative impacts on soil and processes that ultimately affect our health through the microbes in there and something that Russo referred to. On the other hand, if we go to a more sustainable local agroecological methods and use animal manure in our farms, uh, we may provide a one wanted source of antimicrobials and um, antimicrobial resistance and, and, and uh, antibiotics. So it's not clear to me there's a clear um, pathway either way in these two futures, technological or agroecological. And I'd like to ask our panelists very briefly, reflect on these two scenarios in the context of plant health for one health and the kinds of issues that they've come up with in their areas of specialization. So um, I don't have the luxury of looking at body language on a Zoom to find out who wants to talk first. So I'll simply go around uh, my screen and, and uh, Navin, uh, I hope I've, I've characterized those two reasonably well. Um, maybe you'd like to start off with a thought on that. I, I will focus on the environmental health aspects of, of your question, because that's what I know a little bit more about. So in the chat earlier, there were people suggesting organic agriculture as a potential solution. And so I can contrast organic with conventional. Um, so organic agriculture has a, the advantage that it can uh, it, it recycles nutrients. So you, instead of creating harvesting nitrogen from the atmosphere, um, it, it you're recycling nutrients. You're not creating new reactive nitrogen. That's a, that's a great thing. But in terms of uh, environmental outcomes, in terms of environmental health, when you're looking at uh, nitrogen losses uh, to uh, freshwater systems or nitrogen losses into the atmosphere as nitrous oxide. Um, organic agriculture is does not have a better performance. It can actually be worse in some cases because you're applying, in some cases, farmers are applying more nutrients into the soil. Um, and in some cases, the plants are not able to take up nutrients as efficiently as conventional plants, uh, conventional systems do. So in fact, you end up having more nitrogen losses to the system. So there's a case where I feel, you know, you, we, we have a, a I, I, every time I look at the data, I keep finding trade-offs. So there's benefits in one case with recycling nutrients, but then there's a con somewhere else. Great, that's a, that's a nice example. Yeah. Russo, would you like to uh, give a, a, a view on this or an example on this? Oh, you're muted. Yes, yes, it is actually a, a quite interesting example, a quite interesting scenarios where you actually see how the, the various trade-offs uh, between uh, uh, agriculture, environment, and human health. And uh, in some cases, for example, you will see uh, 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 fertilizers or agrochemicals, uh, new, uh, new fertilizers or agrochemicals uh, pump into the environment and in reverse. And there's one thing important that I have to point now. It, it is the, uh, the, 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 the resistance selection, which is a very important issue that uh, pe people of public health are now facing. Like uh, when these chemicals uh, get into contact with, uh, with insects, which are the non-target insects. And it is also interesting to mention that the, 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 the pesticide that they are using 
in agriculture are the same pesticides which are used in public health. It is it's the same active ingredient. So, so this facilitates the development of resistance into malaria vectors, and this increases problems in, into public health. So there's a lot of trade-offs, and, uh, and uh, really there's a need for sustainable approaches to, to well manage this issue. And that's why the, the, the problem of uh, 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 agrochemical should actually be handled under the one hand. Thank you. Great, thank you. Arshni, what about your thoughts on this? I gave an example sort of from your area. <laughs> I think it's... I think it's not going to be a win-win situation. I think we're never going to have something where we have a zero sort of net effect. There's going to be where on one side, there'll be a lot of pros, but then there'll be cons in another. The question is, how much are we willing to accept in terms of risk and risk to whom? But one of the things I think we need to really understand is that when we, when we implement an intervention on one side, what will be the cost benefit to that sector? But then also in terms of other sectors, would they cause any other effects that we're not seeing? But I don't think we're going to be able to sort of come out with this one golden egg that is going to be perfect and everybody wins at the end. Not unless we stop, uh, we, we need less food and we stop growing our populations or we go backwards and reduce our population. So we need less food. But I don't really see that happening. I just think we just have to do the best that we can and make sm as smart choices as we can. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Vivian, what, what thoughts might you have on this question? Well, I mean, I, I think from a food safety perspective, there are hazards that arise both naturally through the agroecological environment, like mycotoxins um, and manure, and, and also through agro-industrial chemicals. So I think in either future scenario or current scenario uh, practiced in various places of the world, we need to be worried about food safety and keep our eyes on these hazards. Right, so whichever way agriculture goes, we still got a problem to deal with. <laughs> um, Janice. You are, do, you have a, do you have a thought on this and how it might reflect the areas that, that you've been focusing on? Technology well, versus agroecology. Well, uh, to my mind, I think this is a big step forward that we're bringing people together and we're talking about this problem holistically. I think um, that much of the problem that we're seeing is that you know agricultural extension and people involved in the production line of it take it to one level. They, they follow maybe the production and the processing and perhaps the storage. And then after that, maybe public health and the economists and so on take over. And we're not really getting a holistic picture along the whole food chain. So I think we need to, to do the same kind of thing we're doing with One Health and get the practitioners also to be working together and, and seeing this as, as one process, not as little bits and pieces. What can we do with our own little bit, but rather than see how everyone can work together. Great, thanks very much, that's great. So Peter, it's time, yes indeed. I'll hand back over to you for the next day. Thank you speakers. Um, we can't do applause very easily, but I think those are great series of presentations and really did uh, cover a broad, broad area. Peter, over to you now. Thank you very much, Jeff, thank you all. Okay, we're moving, we have to move very, very quickly. We have designed um, a very quick exercise where we're going to break you all into four groups. Um, you should, I think, have had an opportunity before the meeting to choose which group you will be in. If you didn't do that, we will assign you. We are going to send you into four groups. Each group has a topic with a, with a great challenge, exactly the thing we've been talking about. Each group has a moderator and they have a colleague to help, help them. And we're going to send you away. You're going to be posed a challenge and they're going to pose to you some questions, a couple of chat questions. Each group will probably be, be, be 50, 60 people. So we're going to move very quickly. Um, Tundi, let's send everybody away. You will go automatically to your group. You will talk for 10 minutes, 10 minutes, and then we come back to the plenary and we will try to make sense of everything. So Tundi, let's send everybody away. Please, um, organizers, speakers, be as quick as you can presenting your challenge and your questions and use the chant with the chat.
Tundi, I'm back in the plenary. Are you still here? Yes, I'm still here. Yeah. Uh, I see a few people who have to be assigned still. I have, a, I have a slide to share with the with the YouTube audience. Do we have people watching on YouTube? Yes, we do. Let me share that slide. Yeah, so we have like 24 people here. Okay, so let me put the slide up. Um, this is for our YouTube audience. Everybody here has gone into small groups. Um, but if you would like to join in, we're happy for you to maybe think you can't really talk and interact in the same way that the people here can. But we have, I've brought some of the questions that we're talking about in our groups. So there's three here. So my suggestion is try and pick one of these questions. We have about eight, nine minutes. And please, can you just type in the YouTube chat, the comment function, just type in, take one of the questions, indicate which number it is, and give us your answer or your comment. That means you can stay involved and we can draw your ideas in when we come to pull together the report from this meeting. So this is for the YouTube colleagues. Yes, so I'm gonna leave this up for a few minutes, the three questions. Yep, I mean, you've been hearing in this conversation about trade-offs. What do you think? What actions would we need to leverage the healthiest outcomes? People in terms of food and plants in terms of environment. And there's the question about agriculture being weaned off chemicals. If you think yes, how would we do it? <laughs> if we can't, why not? And then maybe there's this issue we'd be talking about food safety and AMR and these things. How can we best address those in an equitable way? Given that many of the of the land of the poorest people may be the most contaminated, the people who are less least able to do something are perhaps their land is the most contaminated. So I'm going to leave this up on the screen for a few minutes. This is just for the YouTube audience. I'm going to mute myself. Um, I'll leave this here. Tundi, we need to give people like a two-minute warning when they are going to come back, please, and bring them back. Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we're a bit behind time. We're about four or five minutes over time. I'll leave this up for the YouTube people. I don't know whether somebody monitoring the YouTube channel from our side. Did you know if anyone's monitoring that channel? Oh, I think Taxi uh, should be monitoring that. Okay, so if some, if some questions come in, we'll see them, right? Yeah, yeah, we'll get the questions and put them in the chat box. Super, yeah. Good, I think it's going fine. This is a nice, uh, this is a nice session. We zoomed through. Some of them are much longer than they were supposed to be. Some of the speakers were a bit tight. But they took, the polls are really good because they get people talking, uh, you know, it gets, Jeff and the speakers can really interact around the polls. They, go, they work really nicely. Um, I mean, let me mute myself for a couple of minutes and then I will just...
bringing Stevens here in the plenary, I guess. Tundi, will you send him to a group? Yeah, I've done that. Great. How much more time do we have? Yeah, we have less than six minutes. Six more? No, less than oh. six minutes. Right? Less than six, yeah, please. I hope so. Uh, 5.22. Probably more like four or five. Or oh, 22, they come back, right? Yeah, in two okay. minutes, send the message. Only a, few more, only a couple more minutes then, right? Yeah. Let me give them another three or so. Okay, it looks like the people on the YouTube are not posting questions. That's, I can then stop sharing for a minute, I think, right? Let's so just leave this up. Just leave it up uh, for this session. Yep. Yeah. In case, yeah. So Tundi, I see people still in the waiting room. That, that means they're probably being picked off and they're coming in again, right? Yes, uh, I think people will mistakenly leave the meeting or pass due to network connection. So I have to link yes. back to the meeting and put them back into the room. Okay. So I have less than four minutes. Four, okay, that's good. Yeah, we're gonna be a little bit later. Maybe give them a little bit less. Oh, maybe they need the time to talk. I don't know how it's going in the group. I hope so. We have Sarah here with us. Which is good. Let's forget to send a warning so that they can save the chat because the chat is the most important thing they need. Yes, I've told uh, the comms people to okay. call them in the chat. Okay. Yeah. okay. Good. So they're all being recorded, yeah, but the chat is what we need because the oral won't be so much as the chat is what we need to store. Of people are still coming in. So I'll send a broadcast message. They have less than two minutes. Okay, that's good. Thank you. So we have a couple of colleagues here in the plenary. Where the groups are. Most people are in groups, but the groups are about to finish. So maybe it would be best that we leave you here in the plenary for the next couple of minutes. Unless they're sending you already somewhere. Oh, no, no, no. We just leave them here. I think it's better to stay here now. So Dr. Saima and uh, Mohamedou, we're just going to leave you in the plenary here for a few minutes.
Yeah, so they are coming in now. Okay, great. Welcome back. Oh, I can see Jeff is back. Very good. Okay, welcome back, everybody. Wes, I hope you had a good opportunity. It was a bit quick. Um, while you were away, I can see the people. I'm just going to wait a minute. I'll just keep on talking until everybody's back. Welcome back to the plenary. We hope you had a good conversation. Um, people who are from the organizers and speakers, in a couple of minutes, I'm going to ask you to share back your takeaway messages. So just if you hang on a moment, we will, once everybody's back, we're up to 150 or so. Um, do we expect to have more people coming back still today, or we can go? Yeah. I'm going to go ahead, since our time is tight. Okay, up. everybody, I would like you, we're going to come to the wrapping up. We're almost at the end of this event. Um, I would like you to um, do the same exercise we did. I'm posting in the chat my question. I would like you to take 20 seconds, not 30, to reflect what is your top priority to put plant health for One Health into action, yeah? If you can take 10, 20 seconds, think about it. What's your top priority to put plant health for One Health into action? And I'm gonna do the countdown and I would like you all to post in the chat, what is your top priority? So five, four, three, two, one. Um, please post in the chat. What are your top priorities? Research. Thank you very much. Consumer education. So let's post, please. What are the, your top priorities? Education and regulation. Creating awareness. Good. So keep on posting. I would like to see at least 100 chat messages because we're about 150 people. Tell us what the most, your top priority is. Okay. And while this is happening, Jeff, um, do you want to start? Uh, no, I'm going to go to the group. Do you, do you want to start thinking if you're seeing anything in the chat that is interesting you at the moment? Are you seeing something that you say, wow, that's fabulous, or wow, that's a waste of time? Well, I see some interesting... Are you seeing anything coming through? Yeah, I do. Uh, I think clearly there's an emphasis on research. I suspect we're all researchers, but I think it's justified given... <laughs> the number of unknowns and all of the pathways of interactions that we've been looking at this afternoon. It's, uh, uh, we really, we, we know where the connections are. I think we've had some really good talks about that, but we don't really know what's flowing down them, how important they are in, in many of the contexts we're interested in. Or, you know, as was pointed out, who's responsible, farmers, others, um, is it men or women who are facing the risks and taking the responsibilities there? So um, I think that's interesting. There's a lot of a lot of specific ones that are coming in. I see biochar, a favorite one that keeps coming up in this context. That's good. Um, and um, I, I, uh, I wonder, Peter, if we're reaching time, whether I should give some general thoughts on yeah. it. Is it that time? Yes, one second. Can I ask, can I ask the group? Did we have the four groups. Any group organizer or speaker, could you also post your messages here? Is there anything take away from your groups? Otherwise, Jeff, why don't, while you're presenting, so Navin and the other speakers, so if you have any feedback, please post them. Jeff, give us your final thoughts on the on the session, and then we can, we'll wrap up. Okay, fine. Yeah, great. Well, I do. Yeah, we had a really good session, ours on, on agrochemicals. So I think if, if all the leaders of, of the sessions can put their comments up, that would be brilliant, because we had some really nice ones. I think we've recorded them all. That would be really helpful. So, um, you know, it's interesting. I thought at the beginning in our first talk from Navin, we had this issue of trade-offs. And, uh, and although we led everybody through a discussion of particular problems like antibiotics, food safety, um, pesticides, um, and we presented quite a lot of unilateral questions in the polls of should we get rid of this, should we do this? The message that kept coming back is saying, actually, this is a really complicated system and we're, and we're all gonna have to compromise. You know, There is no single action, no unilateral action that's going to deliver all these results. And I thought that was a really strong feeling that came out of out of the presentations. And it sort of points to the One Health approach, that is to, to look at, at the different sectoral interests and interventions. And we were a truly intersectoral group, as I saw people announcing themselves. We had nutritionists, we had agriculturists, plant breeders, um, we had people working on, on animal health and so on. And it, clearly those are all connected. And clearly I think this, this seminar brief as it is, has really given an impression that there is a potential for dialogue between these sectors that can generate exciting and interesting ideas that might 
address some of the more traditional problems we've had with plant protection um, by making uh, a greater opportunity to make them environmentally safe and safe for humans as well. So that's sort of my takeaway. And I think that the, the enormous amount of chat and feedback will be make for a very interesting set of conclusions, which, which we can share with everybody who's participated and more broadly. Great, thanks, Jeff. Um, I, I was really taken by Navin's comment that the more data we find, the more trade-offs we discover. And I was really struck by that. It was something I'm gonna think about a bit more. Okay, we're going to move on. I'm going to come into the very end. I would like just to, to appreciate the colleagues, the partners, the sponsors of this particular webinar. Um, they're all represented here. I saw John McDermott earlier, who's the director of the A4NH, who's with us. Um, I saw Nicolene Dehan from the Gender Platform. So we very much appreciate your support for this event and the, and the organization, the speakers and organizers about there. Um, those, I want to thank you, organizers. Thank you, our moderator, Jeff. Fabulous, super. Tough to cope, cope with all that chat very quickly. Thank you all very much for posting all of your chat, all your comments. Really appreciate it. I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Titilayo Palade from IITA. And she is going to say a few remarks, I think quite brief, Titilayo, because this is the last of the four webinars. Titilayo, over to you. I hope you're with us still. Yes, I am. Thank you very much. So um, on behalf of the organizing committee, I uh, would like to thank all the panelists, uh, Navin, Rosso, Ashni, uh, Vivian, Janice. Thank you so much for your contributions to this webinar and Elikana for sending his slides ahead. In the interest of time, I would not talk too much about what you have, you have talked about today, but they have been very insightful sessions for us and we've all learned a lot from what you have talked about. Many thanks also to Jeff through your skillful moderation, you've helped to coordinate the discussions around this very complex subject of One Health. And having that kind of dexterity has helped us to weave these concepts together, gender, pesticides, mycotoxins, antimicrobial resistance, all of them navigating the concerns and the uh, opportunities that we have relating human health, plant health into the One Health concept. And Peter, thank you so much. You've helped us to keep our balance in this complexity. Like One Health, we've had many complex things to deal with, with the IT, the polls, timekeeping. Thank you so much for, for assisting and, and guiding us through the process. And thanks also to the team at IITA for the great support in making sure that the technical aspects of the Zoom sessions were well organized and we had very important and good conversations. So I would like to mention that webinar four marks the end of the four parts uh, webinar series titled Unleashing the Potential of Plant Health, organized by the CGIAR to mark the International Year of Plant Health in this year. And we would like to thank all our participants and panelists in all the webinars. The first three webinars, we had very good sessions to celebrate this International Year of Plant Health as we did in this one. And we've had familiar names and faces from the earlier sessions, which started in, in January. And we sincerely thank you for being with us through this series. Since we've launched the CGIAR International Year of Plant Health webinar series, we've had collectively almost 5,000 people who signed up. I think this is very impressive and shows the interest in this, in this subject. And registrants have been from all over the world, including Asia, Africa, Europe, and America, as we have seen today represented. So we are also happy that in the last uh, webinars, we could engage with around 3,000 participants who connected through Zoom and YouTube live stream. And we would know the final count following our webinar today, but we know that we've had very astounding representation from across the world and, and in good numbers. So we thank you for being part of our webinar today and through the other webinars as well. The webinar series has been a joint effort of various centers under the CGIAR. Among our hosts have been CIMIT, SIP, IITA, ERI, and IFPRI. We've also been backed tremendously by our core centers and have been generously supported by various CGIAR platforms, including A4NH, RTB, Agenda. 
Apart from our colleagues at uh, CGIR, we are also grateful for the support of our partners who have been helping us with organizing the series by being speakers, moderators, and in the coming months, become co-authors of journal articles we hope to publish. So our work does not stop after today's session. We continue to advocate for plant health as a way of improving our food system, especially now that we are battling both a climate crisis and a health crisis, which is affecting our world in many ways, socially, economically, and even political landscapes. In the coming months, together with our partner organizations, we would be publishing opinion pieces, as we've mentioned during this webinar. These would be addressing some of the things that we have discussed in the webinar series. And we hope that through these pieces, we can propose solutions and policy recommendations that can be used by decision makers to improve plant health and in the long run, aid in food and nutrition security. If you missed the first three webinars, not to worry, you can still catch up. And if you would like to know more about CGIR's work in plant health, you can find resources in our official webinar microsite, and that is shown on the screen right now. So just go there and you'll find links to the YouTube videos and the resources. So on that note, we end the webinar series marking the International Year of Plant Health 2021. Again, we thank you for your support and we hope you join us again in future conversations. Bye everyone, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lyon.